The Horror of the Heights by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Daniker. The Horror of the Heights by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The idea that the extraordinary narrative which has been called the Joyce Armstrong fragment is an elaborate practical joke evolved by some unknown person, cursed by a perverted and sinister sense of humor, has now been abandoned by all who have examined the matter. The most macabre and imaginative of plotters would hesitate before linking his morbid fancies with the unquestioned and tragic facts which reinforce the statement although the assertions contained in it are amazing and even monstrous it is none the less forcing itself upon the general intelligence that they are true and that we must readjust our ideas to the new situation this world of ours appears to be separated by a slight and precarious margin of safety from a most singular and unexpected danger I will endeavor in this narrative, which reproduces the original document in its necessarily somewhat fragmentary form, to lay before the reader the whole of the facts up to date, prefacing my statement by saying that, if there be any who doubt the narrative of Joyce Armstrong, there can be no question at all as to the facts concerning Lieutenant Myrtle, R.N., and Mr. Hay Connor, who undoubtedly met their end in the manner described. The Joyce Armstrong fragment was found in the field which is called Lower Haycock, lying one mile to the westward of the village of Withiam upon the Kent and Sussex border. It was on the 15th September last that an agricultural laborer, James Flynn, in the employment of Matthew Dodd, farmer of the Chauntry Farm Withiam, perceived a briar pipe lying near the footpath which skirts the hedge in Lower Haycock. A few paces farther on, he picked up a pair of broken binocular glasses. Finally, among some nettles in the ditch, he caught sight of a flat, canvas-backed book, which proved to be a notebook with detachable leaves, some of which had come loose and were fluttering along the base of the hedge. These he collected, but some, including the first, were never recovered, and leave a deplorable hiatus in this all-important statement. The notebook was taken by the laborer to his master, who in turn showed it to Dr. J. H. Atherton of Hartfield. This gentleman at once recognized the need for an expert examination, and the manuscript was forwarded to the Aero Club in London, where it now lies. The first two pages of the manuscript are missing. There is also one torn away at the end of the narrative, though none of these affect the general coherence of the story. It is conjectured that the missing opening is concerned with the record of Mr. Joyce Armstrong's qualifications as an aeronaut, which can be gathered from other sources and are admitted to be unsurpassed among the air pilots of England. For many years he has been looked upon as amongst the most daring and the most intellectual of flying men, a combination which has enabled him to both invent and test several new devices including the common gyroscopic attachment, which is known by his name. The main body of the manuscript is written neatly in ink, but the last few lines are in pencil, and are so ragged as to be hardly legible, exactly, in fact, as they might be expected to appear if they were scribbled off hurriedly from the seat of a moving aeroplane. There are, it may be added, several stains, both on the last page and on the outside cover, which have been pronounced by the Home Office experts to be blood, probably human, and certainly mammalian. The fact that something closely resembling the organism of malaria was discovered in this blood, and that Joyce Armstrong is known to have suffered from intermittent fever, is a remarkable example of the new weapons which modern science has placed in the hands of our detectives. And now a word as to the personality of the author of this epic-making statement. Joyce Armstrong, according to a few friends who really knew something of the man, was a poet and a dreamer, as well as a mechanic and an inventor. 
He was a man of considerable wealth, much of which he spent in the pursuit of his aeronautical hobby. He had four private aeroplanes in his hangar near Devices, and is said to have made no fewer than 170 ascents in the course of last year. He was a retiring man with dark moods in which he would avoid the society of his fellows. Captain Dangerfield, who knew him better than anyone, says that there were times when his eccentricity threatened to develop into something more serious. His habit of carrying a shotgun with him in his aeroplane was one manifestation of it. Another was the morbid effect which the fall of Lieutenant Myrtle had upon his mind. Myrtle, who was attempting the height record, fell from an altitude of something over 30,000 feet. Horrible to narrate, his head was entirely obliterated, though his body and limbs preserved their configuration. At every gathering of airmen, Joyce Armstrong, according to Dangerfield, would ask with an enigmatic smile, and where, pray, is Myrtle's head? On another occasion after dinner, at the mess of the flying school in Salisbury Plain, he started a debate as to what will be the most permanent danger which airmen will have to encounter. Having listened to successful opinions as to air pockets, faulty construction, and overbanking, he ended by shrugging his shoulders and refusing to put forward his own views, though he gave the impression that they differed from any advanced by his companions. It is worth remarking that after his own complete disappearance, it was found that his private affairs were arranged with a precision which may show that he had a strong premonition of disaster. With these essential explanations, I will now give the narrative exactly as it stands, beginning at page 3 of the blood-soaked notebook. Nevertheless, when I dined at Rems with Cassilia and Gustav Raymond, I found that neither of them was aware of any particular danger in the higher layers of the atmosphere. I did not actually say what was in my thoughts, but I got so near to it that if they had any corresponding idea, they could not have failed to express it. But then they are two empty, vainglorious fellows with no thought beyond seeing their silly names in the newspaper. It is interesting to note that neither of them had ever been much beyond the 20,000-foot level. Of course, men have been higher than this both in balloons and in the ascent of mountains. It must be well above that point that the aeroplane enters the danger zone, always presuming that my premonitions are correct. Aeroplaning has been with us now for more than twenty years, and one might well ask, why should this peril be only revealing itself in our day? The answer is obvious. In the old days of weak engines, when a hundred-horsepower gnome or green was considered to be ample for every need, the flights were very restricted. Now that 300 horsepower is the rule rather than the exception, visit to the upper layers have become easier and more common. Some of us can remember how, in our youth, Garros made a worldwide reputation by attaining 19,000 feet and it was considered a remarkable achievement to fly over the Alps. Our standard now has been immeasurably raised, and there are 25 high flights for one in former years. Many of them have been undertaken with impunity. The 30,000-foot level has been reached time after time with no discomfort beyond cold and asthma. What does this prove? A visitor might descend upon this planet a thousand times and never see a tiger. Yet tigers exist, and if he chanced to come down in a jungle, he might be devoured. There are jungles of the upper air, and there are worse things than tigers which inhabit them. I believe in time they will map these jungles accurately out. Even at the present moment, I could name two of them. One of them lies over the Pau Biretz district in France. Another is just above my head as I write here in my house in Wiltshire. I rather think there is a third in the Hamburg-Wiesbaden district. It was the disappearance of the airmen that first set me thinking. Of course, everyone said that they had fallen into the sea, but that did not satisfy me at all. First, there was Verrier in France. 
His machine was found near Bayonne, but they never got his body. There was the case of Baxter also, who vanished, though his engine and some of the iron fixings were found in a wood in Leicestershire. In that case, Dr. Middleton of Amesbury, who was watching the flight with a telescope, declares that just before the clouds obscured the view, he saw the machine, which was at an enormous height, suddenly rise perpendicularly upwards in a succession of jerks in a manner that he would have thought to be impossible. That was the last ever seen of Baxter. There was a correspondence in the papers, but it never led to anything. There were several other similar cases, and then there was the death of Hay Connor. What a cackle there was about an unsolved mystery of the air, and what columns in the halfpenny papers, and yet how little was ever done to get to the bottom of the business. He came down in a tremendous volplane from an unknown height. He never got off his machine and died in the pilot seat. Died of what? Heart disease, says the doctors. Rubbish. Hay Connor's heart was as sound as mine is. Well, what did Venables say? Venables was the only man who was at his side when he died. He said that he was shivering and looked like a man who had been badly scared. Died of fright, said Venables, but could not imagine what he was frightened about. Only said one word to Venables, which sounded like monstrous. They could make nothing of that at the inquest, but I could make something of it. Monsters. That was the last word of poor Harry Hay Connor, and he did die of fright, just as Venables thought. And then there was Myrtle's head. Do you really believe, does anyone really believe, that a man's head could be driven clean into his body by the force of a fall? Well, perhaps it may be possible, but I, for one, have never believed that it was so with Myrtle. And the grease upon his clothes, all slimy with grease, said someone at the inquest. Queer that no one got thinking after that. I did, but then I had been thinking for a good long time. I've made three ascents. How Dangerfield used to chaff me about my shotgun, but I've never been high enough. Now, with this new light Paul Verone machine and its 175 Robur, I should easily touch 30,000 tomorrow. I'll have a shot at the record. Maybe I'll have a shot at something else as well. Of course it's dangerous. If a fellow wants to avoid danger, he had best keep out of flying altogether and subside finally into flannel slippers and a dressing gown. But I'll visit the air jungle tomorrow, and if there is anything there, I shall know it. If I return, I'll find myself a bit of a celebrity. If I don't, this notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it. But no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. I chose my Paul Verone monoplane for the job. There's nothing like a monoplane when real work is to be done. Beaumont found that out in the very early days. For one thing, it doesn't mind damp, and the weather looks as if we should be in the clouds all of the time. It's a bonny little model and answers my hand like a tender-mouthed horse. The engine is a ten-cylinder rotary robur working up to 175. It has all the modern improvements, enclosed fuselage, high-curved landing skids, brakes, gyroscopic steadiers, and three speeds worked by an alteration of the angle of the planes upon the Venetian blind principle. I took a shotgun with me and a dozen cartridges filled with buckshot. You should have seen the face of Perkins, my old mechanic, when I directed him to put them in. I was dressed like an Arctic explorer with two jerseys under my overalls, thick socks inside my padded boots, a storm cap with flaps, and my talc goggles. It was stifling outside the hangars, but I was going for the summit of the Himalayas and had to dress for the part. Perkins knew there was something on and implored me to take him with me. Perhaps I should if I were using the biplane, but a monoplane is a one-man show, if you want to get the last foot of life out of it. Of course I took an oxygen bag. The man who goes for the altitude record without one will either be frozen, or smothered, or both. I had a good look at the planes, the rudder bar, and the elevating lever before I got in. Everything was in order so far as I could see. 
Then I switched on my engine and found that she was running sweetly. When they let her go, she rose almost at once upon the lowest speed. I circled my home field once or twice just to warm her up, and then with a wave to Perkins and the others, I flattened out my planes and put her on her highest. She skimmed like a swallow downwind for eight or ten miles until I turned her nose up a little and she began to climb in a great spiral for the cloud bank above me. It's all important to rise slowly and adapt yourself to the pressure as you go. It was a close, warm day for an English September and there was a hush and heaviness of impending rain. Now and then there came sudden puffs of wind from the southwest, one of them so gusty and unexpected that it caught me napping and turned me half round for an instant. I remember the time when gusts and whirls and air pockets used to be things of danger, before we learned to put an overmastering power into our engines. Just as I reached the cloud banks, with the altimeter marking 3,000, down came the rain. My word how it poured! It drummed upon my wings and lashed against my face, blurring my glasses so that I could hardly see. I got down onto a low speed, for it was painful to travel against it. As I got higher, it became hail, and I had to turn tail to it. One of my cylinders was out of action, a dirty plug, I should imagine, but still I was rising steadily with plenty of power. After a bit, the trouble passed, whatever it was, and I heard the full, deep-throated purr, the ten singing as one. That's where the beauty of our modern silencers comes in. We can at last control our engines by ear. How they squeal and squeak and sob when they are in trouble. All those cries for help were wasted in the old days when every sound was swallowed up by the monstrous racket of the machine. If only the early aviators could come back to see the beauty and perfection of the mechanism which have been bought at the cost of their lives. About 9.30 I was nearing the clouds. Down below me, all blurred and shadowed with rain, lay the vast expanse of Salisbury Plain. Half a dozen flying machines were doing hack work at the thousand-foot level, looking like little black swallows against the green background. I dare say they were wondering what I was doing up in cloudland. Suddenly a gray curtain drew across beneath me, and the wet folds of vapors were swirling round my face. It was clamily cold and miserable. But I was above the hailstorm, and that was something gained. The cloud was as dark and thick as a London fog. In my anxiety to get clear, I cocked her nose up until the automatic alarm bell rang, and I actually began to slide backwards. My sopped and dripping wings had made me heavier than I thought, but presently I was in lighter cloud and soon had cleared the first layer. There was a second, opal-colored and fleecy, at a great height above my head, a white, unbroken ceiling above, and a dark, unbroken floor below, with a monoplane laboring upward on a vast spiral between them. It is deadly lonely in these cloud spaces. Once a great flight of some small water bird went past me, flying very fast to the westward. The quick whir of their wings and their musical cry were cheery to my ear. I fancied that they were teal, but I am a wretched zoologist. Now that we humans have become birds, we must really learn to know our brethren by sight. The wind down beneath me whirled and swayed the broad cloud plain. Once a great eddy formed in it a whirlpool of vapor, and through it, as down a funnel, I caught sight of the distant world. A large white biplane was passing at a vast depth beneath me. I fancy it was the morning mail service betwixt Bristol and London. Then the drift swirled inward again, and the great solitude was unbroken. Just after ten, I touched the lower edge of the upper cloud stratum. It consisted of fine diaphanous vapor drifting swiftly from the westward. The wind had been steadily rising all this time, and it was now blowing a sharp breeze. Twenty-eight an hour by my gauge. Already it was very cold, though my altimeter only marked nine thousand. The engines were working beautifully, and we went droning steadily upwards. The cloud bank was thicker than I had expected. 
but at last it thinned out into a golden mist before me, and then in an instant I had shot out from it, and there was an unclouded sky and a brilliant sun above my head, all blue and gold above, all shining silver below, one vast, glimmering plain as far as my eyes could reach. It was a quarter past ten o'clock, and the barograph needle pointed to 12,800. Up I went, and up, my ears concentrated upon the deep purring of my motor, my eyes busy always with the watch, the revolution indicator, the petrol lever, and the oil pump. No wonder aviators are said to be a fearless race. With so many things to think of, there is no time to trouble about oneself. About this time, I noted how unreliable is the compass when above a certain height from the earth. At 15,000 feet, mine was pointing east and a point south. The sun and the wind gave me my true bearings. I had hoped to reach an eternal stillness in these high altitudes, but with every thousand feet of ascent, the gale grew stronger. My machine groaned and trembled in every joint and rivet as she faced it, and swept away like a sheet of paper when I banked her on the turn, skimming downwind at a greater pace, perhaps, than ever mortal man has moved. Yet, I had always to turn again and tack into the wind's eye, for it was not merely the height record that I was after. By all my calculations, it was above Little Wiltshire that my air jungle lay, and all my labor might be lost if I struck the outer layers at some farther point. When I reached the 19,000-foot level, which was about midday, the wind was so severe that I looked with some anxiety to the stays of my wings, expecting momentarily to see them snap or slacken. I even cast loose the parachute behind me and fastened its hook onto the ring of my leathern belt so as to be ready for the worst. Now was the time when a bit of scant work by the mechanic was paid for by the life of the aeronaut. But she held together bravely. Every chord and strut was humming and vibrating like so many harp strings. But it was glorious to see how, for all the beating and buffeting, she was still the conqueror of nature and the mistress of the sky. There is surely something divine in man himself that he should rise so superior to the limitations which creation seemed to impose. Rise, too, by such unselfish heroic devotion as this air conquest has shown. Talk of human denigration! When has such a story as this been written in the annals of our race? These were the thoughts in my head as I climbed that monstrous inclined plane, with a wind sometimes beating in my face and sometimes whistling behind my ears while the cloudland beneath me fell away to such a distance that the folds and hummocks of silver had all smoothed out into one flat, shining plain. But suddenly I had a horrible and unprecedented experience. I have known before what it is to be in what our neighbors have called a tourbillon, but never on such a scale as this, that huge sweeping river of wind of which I have spoken, had as it appears, whirlpools within it, which were as monstrous as itself. Without a moment's warning, I was dragged suddenly into the heart of one. I spun round for a minute or two with such velocity that I almost lost my senses, and then fell suddenly, left wing foremost, down the vacuum funnel in the center. I dropped like a stone and lost nearly a thousand feet. It was only my belt that kept me in my seat, and the shock and breathlessness left me hanging half insensible over the side of the fuselage. But I am always capable of a supreme effort. It is my one great merit as an aviator. I was conscious that the descent was slower. The whirlpool was a cone rather than a funnel, and I had come to the apex. With a terrific wrench throwing my weight all to one side, I leveled my planes and brought her head away from the wind. In an instant I had shot out of the eddies and was skimming down the sky. Then, shaken but victorious, I turned her nose up and began once more my steady grind on the upward spiral. 
I took a large sweep to avoid the danger spot of the whirlpool, and soon I was safely above it. Just after one o'clock, I was 21,000 feet above sea level. To my great joy, I had topped the gale, and with every hundred feet of ascent, the air grew stiller. On the other hand, it was very cold, and I was conscious of that peculiar nausea that goes with the rarefication of the air. For the first time, I unscrewed the mouth of my oxygen bag and took an occasional whiff of the glorious gas. I could feel it running like a cordial through my veins, and I was exhilarated almost to the point of drunkenness. I shouted and sang as I soared upward into the cold, still outer world. It is very clear to me that the insensibility which came upon Glacier and in a lesser degree upon Coxwell, when, in 1862, they ascended in a balloon to a height of 30,000 feet, was due to the extreme speed with which a perpendicular ascent is made. Doing it in an easy gradient, and accustoming oneself to the lessened barometric pressure by slow degrees, there are no such dreadful symptoms. At the same great height, I found that even without my oxygen inhaler, I could breathe without undue distress. It was bitterly cold, however, and my thermometer was at zero Fahrenheit. At 1.30, I was nearly seven miles above the surface of the earth and still ascending steadily. I found, however, that the rarefied air was giving markedly less support to my planes, and that my angle of ascent had to be considerably lowered in consequence. It was already clear that even with my light weight and strong engine power, there was a point in front of me where I should be held. To make matters worse, one of my sparking plugs was in trouble again, and there was intermittent misfiring in the engine. My heart was heavy with the fear of failure. It was about this time that I had a most extraordinary experience. Something whizzed past me in a trail of smoke and exploded with a loud hissing sound, sending forth a cloud of steam. For the instant I could not imagine what had happened. Then I remembered that the earth is forever being bombarded by meteor stones and would be hardly inhabitable were they not, in nearly every case, turned to vapor in the high outer layers of the atmosphere. Here is a new danger for the high-altitude man, for two others passed me when I was nearing the 40,000-foot mark. I cannot doubt that at the edge of the Earth's envelope, the risk would be a very real one. My barograph needle marked 41,300 when I became aware that I could go no further. Physically, the strain was not as yet greater than I could bear, but my machine had reached its limit. The attenuated air gave no firm support to the wings, and the least tilt developed into a side slip while she seemed sluggish on her controls. Possibly, had the engine been at its best, another thousand feet might have been within our capacity, but it was still misfiring, and two out of the ten cylinders appeared to be out of action. If I had not already reached the zone for which I was searching, then I should never see it upon this journey. But was it not possible that I had attained it? Soaring in circles like a monstrous hawk upon the 40,000-foot level, I let the monoplane guide herself, and with my Mannheim glass, I made a careful observation of my surroundings. The heavens were perfectly clear. There was no indication of those dangers which I had imagined. I have said that I was soaring in circles. It struck me suddenly that I would do well to take a wider sweep and open up a new air tract. If the hunter entered an earth jungle, he would drive through it if he wished to find his game. My reasoning had led me to believe that the air jungle which I had imagined lay somewhere over Wiltshire. This should be to the south and to the west of me. I took my bearings from the sun, for the compass was hopeless and no trace of earth was to be seen, nothing but the distant silver cloud plain. However, I got my direction as best I might, and I kept her head straight to the mark. I reckoned that my petrol supply would not last more than another hour or so, but I could afford to use it to the last drop, since a single magnificent vol plane could at any time take me to the earth. 
suddenly I was aware of something new. The air in front of me had lost its crystal clearness. It was full of long, ragged wisps of something which I can only compare to very fine cigarette smoke. It hung about in wreaths and coils, turning and twisting slowly in the sunlight. As the monoplane shot through it, I was aware of a faint taste of oil upon my lips, and there was a greasy scum upon the woodwork of the machine. Some infinitely fine organic matter appeared to be suspended in the atmosphere. There was no life there. It was inchoate and diffuse, extending for many square miles and then fringing off into the void. No, it was not life, but might it not be the remnants of life? Above all, might it not be the food of life, of monstrous life, even as the humble grease of the ocean is food for the mighty whale? The thought was in my mind when my eyes looked upward and I saw the most wonderful vision that man has ever seen. Can I hope to convey it to you even as I saw it myself last Thursday? Conceive a jellyfish such as sails in our summer seas, bell-shaped and of enormous size, far larger, I should judge, than the dome of St. Paul's. It was of a light pink color veiled with a delicate green, but the whole huge fabric so tenuous that it was but a fairy outline against the dark blue sky. It pulsated with a delicate and regular rhythm. From it there depended two long, drooping green tentacles which swayed slowly backwards and forwards. This gorgeous vision passed gently with noiseless dignity over my head as light and fragile as a soap bubble, and drifted upon its stately way. I half turned my monoplane that I might look after this beautiful creature when, in a moment, I found myself amidst a perfect fleet of them, of all sizes, but none so large as the first. Some were quite small, but the majority about as big as an average balloon, and with much the same curvature at the top. There was in them a delicacy of texture and coloring which reminded me of the finest Venetian glass. Pale shades of pink and green were the prevailing tints, but all had a lovely iridescence where the sun shimmered through their dainty forms. Some hundreds of them drifted past me, a wonderful fairy squadron of strange, unknown argosies of the sky creatures whose form and substance were so attuned to these pure heights that one could not conceive anything so delicate with an actual sight or sound of the earth. But soon my attention was drawn to a new phenomenon, the serpents of the outer air. These were long, thin, fantastic coils of vapor-like material which turned and twisted with great speed, flying round and round at such a pace that the eyes could hardly follow them. Some of these ghost-like creatures were twenty or thirty feet long, but it was difficult to tell their girth, for their outline was so hazy that it seemed to fade away into the air around them. These air snakes were of a very light gray or smoke color, with some darker lines within, which gave the impression of a definite organism. One of them whisked past my very face, and I was conscious of a cold, clammy contact, but their composition was so unsubstantial that I could not connect them with any thought of physical danger, any more than the beautiful bell-line creatures which had preceded them. There was no more solidity in their frames than in the floating spume from a broken wave. But a more terrible experience was in store for me. Floating downward from a great height there came a purplish patch of vapor, small as I saw at first, but rapidly enlarging as it approached me, until it appeared to be hundreds of square feet in size. Though fashioned of some transparent, jelly-like substance, it was nonetheless of much more definite outline and solid consistence than anything which I had seen before. There were more traces, too, of a physical organization, especially two vast, shadowy, circular plates on either side which may have been eyes and a perfectly solid white projection between them which was as curved and as cruel as the beak of a vulture the whole aspect of this monster was formidable and threatening 
and it kept changing its color from a very light mauve to a dark, angry purple so thick that it cast a shadow as it drifted between my monoplane and the sun. On the upper curve of its huge body there were three great projections which I can only describe as enormous bubbles, and I was convinced as I looked at them that they were charged with some extremely light gas which served to buoy up the misshapen and semi-solid mass in the rarefied air. The creature moved swiftly along, keeping easy pace with a monoplane, and for twenty miles or more it formed my horrible escort, hovering over me like a bird of prey which is waiting to pounce. Its method of progression, done so swiftly that it was not easy to follow, was to throw out a long, glutinous streamer in front of it, which in turn seemed to draw forward the rest of the writhing body. So elastic and gelatinous was it that never for two successive minutes was it the same shape, and yet each change made it more threatening and loathsome than the last. I knew that it meant mischief. Every purple flush of its hideous body told me so. The vague, goggling eyes which were turned always upon me were cold and merciless in their viscid hatred. I dipped the nose of my monoplane downward to escape it, as I did so, as quick as a flash, there shot out a long tentacle from this mass of floating blubber, and it fell as light and sinuous as a whiplash across the front of my machine. There was a loud hiss as it lay for a moment across the hot engine, and it whisked itself into the air again while the huge flat body drew itself together as if in sudden pain. I dipped to a old peak, but again a tentacle fell over the monoplane and was shorn off by the propeller as easily as it might have cut through a smoke wreath. A long, gliding, sticky, serpent-line coil came from behind and caught me round the waist, dragging me out of the fuselage. I tore at it, my finger sinking into the smooth, glue-like surface, and for an instant I disengaged myself, but only to be caught round the boot by another coil which gave me a jerk that tilted me almost onto my back. As I fell over, I blazed off both barrels of my gun, though indeed it was like attacking an elephant with a pea-shooter to imagine that any human weapon could cripple that mighty bulk. And yet I aimed better than I knew, for with a loud report, one of the great blisters upon the creature's back exploded with a puncture of the buckshot. It was very clear that my conjecture was right, and that these vast, clear bladders were distended with some lifting gas, for in an instant the huge, cloud-like body turned sideways, writhing desperately to find its balance, while the white beak snapped and gaped in horrible fury. But already I had shot away on the steepest glide that I dared to attempt, my engine still full on, the flying propeller and the force of gravity shooting me downwards like an arrow light. Far behind me I saw a dull, purplish smudge growing swiftly smaller and merging into the blue sky behind it. I was safe out of the deadly jungle of the outer air. Once out of danger I throttled my engine, for nothing tears a machine to pieces quicker than running on full power from a height. It was a glorious spiral volplane from nearly eight miles of altitude, first to the level of the silver cloud bank, then to that of the storm cloud beneath it, and finally, in the beating rain, to the surface of the earth. I saw the Bristol Channel beneath me as I broke from the clouds, but having some petrol in my tank, I got twenty miles inland before I found myself stranded in a field half a mile from the village of Ashcombe. There I got six tins of petrol from a passing motor car, and at ten minutes past six that evening... I alighted gently in my own home meadow at Devesis after such a journey as no mortal upon earth has ever yet taken and lived to tell the tale. I have seen the beauty, and I have seen the horror of the heights, and greater beauty, or greater horror than that, is not within the ken of man. And now it is my plan to go once again before I give my results to the world. My reason for this is that I must surely have something to show by way of proof before I lay such a tale before my fellow men. It is true that others will soon follow and will confirm what I have said, and yet I should wish to carry conviction from the first. 
Those lovely iridescent bubbles of air should not be hard to capture. They drift slowly upon their way, and the swift monoplane could intercept their leisurely course. It is likely enough that they would dissolve in the heavier layers of the atmosphere, and that some small heap of amorphous jelly might be all that I should bring to earth with me. And yet, something there would surely be by which I could substantiate my story. Yes, I will go, even if I run a risk by doing so. These purple horrors would not seem to be numerous. It is probable that I shall not see one. If I do, I shall dive at once. At the worst, there is always the shotgun. And my knowledge... Here a page of the manuscript is unfortunately missing. On the next page is written, in large, straggling writing, 43,000 feet. I shall never see the earth again. They are beneath me. Three of them. God help me. It's an awful way to die. Such in its entirety is the Joyce Armstrong statement. Of the man, nothing has since been seen. Pieces of his shattered monoplane have been picked up in the preserves of Mr. Bud Lushington upon the borders of Kenton, Sussex, within a few miles of the spot where the notebook was discovered. If the unfortunate aviator's theory is correct that this air jungle, as he called it, existed only over the southwest of England, then it would seem that he had fled from it at the full speed of his monoplane, but had been overtaken and devoured by these horrible creatures at some spot in the outer atmosphere above the place where the grim relics were found. The picture of that monoplane skimming down the sky with the nameless terrors flying as swiftly behind it and cutting it off always from the earth while they gradually closed upon their victim is one upon which a man who valued his sanity would prefer not to dwell. There are many, as I am aware, who still jeer at the facts which I have set down, but even they must admit that Joyce Armstrong has disappeared, and I would commend to them his own words. This notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it, but no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. End of the Horror of the Heights Recording by Scott Daniker Elizabeth City, North Carolina